Time to get these solar panels fixed up. I'll need the extra power from these to run the basic refinery and the assembler in the plant room. It's nowhere near as powerful as the nuclear reactor, but it should be enough to cope with the production of all the components and steel plates I'll need to repair the moon base's exterior, and, probably more importantly, to repair the refinery and production module at the far side of the moon base. I'm actually surprised that A1 didn't repair these earlier, unless he just didn't feel it was necessary to do so, and that half the solar array was enough to keep his life support operational and power a small army of robots. Speaking of A1, I've been in brief contact with Marshall Gordon. He did some investigating, and it turns out that our friend's full name is Aaron Arthur. <laughs> I guess that's where the name A1 came from, I suppose. Well, according to the records they had, Aaron was the only child of a couple of scientists that worked here back when the place was still operational. Apparently the entire family was evacuated, along with all the others back in the day, and his parents have both since passed away, which doesn't surprise me since we're both quite old anyway. I'm not sure why he came back here though, unless this place, being part of his childhood and all that, held some sort of special meaning for him. I mean, from what little I've seen so far, it's very much clear that he's not quite all there, so I strongly suspect that he's either mentally ill or possibly even slightly autistic. Which would certainly explain both his heightened intelligence and his fixation with robots. What does have me concerned, however, is that I checked the area again earlier and there's definitely no sign of any rovers, shuttlecraft or any other vessels around which suggests that he either scrapped his own ship for spare parts after he landed, or someone else brought him here. And, as I mentioned earlier, since I found discarded food packets scattered about the base that appeared to be very recently made, as well as weird transhuman robot hentai porn video chips, I strongly suspect that he's got an accomplice somewhere out there that's been bringing him supplies. Thankfully, all the moon base's sensors and all but one of its Gatling turrets are fully operational again, so if we do receive any uninvited guests, then at least we'll be able to see them coming, and, if necessary, be able to shoot back at them if they try to attack. Well, that's providing they don't try to obliterate us from orbit, of course, but fear not, because I do actually have plans to build defences against that exact sort of thing too later on. But right now, I just need to get this place up and running again. And for that, we need more power. While I was talking to the Marshal earlier, he sent me some files that had some recent news about what's going on out there. Terra Nova is still under blockade, they've not been able to lift it, but the Terran CDF are still giving the ROS invaders a hard time, attacking their mining operations, and making it difficult for them to resupply and repair their vessels. Good on them, I hope they make life miserable for those invaders. ROS have called on Mars to assist, and the Martian Federation have promised to send help, but there's been no official response yet. In the Sol system, apparently there's been a terrorist attack on Karl Marx Station, where a small nuclear device was detonated just outside, causing minor structural damage and only a handful of casualties. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how that happened. There's also some news that the Martian Federation have begun occupying some of the orbital stations around Saturn, and may also be about to blockade Titan City, which is the largest orbital habitat over there and has so far refused to swear allegiance to Mars, instead wishing to remain neutral. The Martian government and their media lackeys have also started to refer to all the TCA and CDF forces as Terran Renegades, or just the Renegades. Yeah, I love the spin they're trying to put on this to make it appear as though we're the bad guys. Yeah, I guess some things never change. Anyway, that looks about right. The solar panels have been fully repaired and I've even added them onto the correct group. That way, the script that the moon base uses to make them track the sun should kick in very shortly. There we go. They are moving, just very slowly. You can see that the angles changed more clearly from over here. Anyway, my suit's energy is starting to get a little low, so I'm going to head back inside now. I'll check up on those solar panels again once I'm back in ops. Benson, how are you getting on with your analysis of A1's robot fabrication and repair cubicles? I mean, heck knows I've spent long enough going around the base earlier disassembling what's left of the damn things. So, as you'd imagine, it would really cheer me up to hear that we can build them ourselves and make our own robots. 
Yes, Captain. I have fully completed my analyses, and to be even improved upon the original design, allowing it to be connected to an active conveyor network, and automatically for the required components, for the bug construction. That's excellent, Ben. Well done. Thank you, Captain. But be advised that the software used in the robot's AI processor still contain many errors and entire lines of code appear to be missing. I would therefore advise extreme caution when using them. Thanks, Ben. Don't worry, I only plan on using them for welding, grinding, and conducting some basic repairs. I have absolutely no intention of arming the mechanical bastards. At least, not yet. As you wish, Captain. Well, now that the solar panels are fixed, it's time to make a start on building one of those miniature robot factories. Because why do all the hard work yourself when you can have machines do it for you? Right, this robo factory I'm planning to build has a conveyor port on the underside, so these two conveyors that link it to the O2H2 generator should be enough. You know what? To hell with it. I'll just take all the components. Yeah, that should be fine. And there it is. That's not too bad if you ask me, although I can't help but feel that it looks somewhat familiar. I just hope that none of my guests in the future mistake it for the medical room. That could be painful. Right, let's go and make our first robot. Now, everything's already been set up by Ben. I just need to click on build, and there we go. That's quite impressive. I wonder how long it'll take to build. There we go. It even comes with its own welding torch. Okay, repair bot one, report status. Or not. Ah, I think we might have a problem, Benson. It appears to be glitching out. Apologies, Captain. It appears as the repair bot 1 is having difficulty processing the layout of the facility and the nearest path to each of the blocks that require repair. I would recommend patience and advise that you give it time to update its software. Ah, that explains the icon on my HUD. No worries, Benson. I'll head back to Ops and turn on the build and repair projector whilst we wait. I've already given it all my spare components, so it can pretty much get to work as soon as it's ready. And if this one proves to be a success, I am tempted to create another one that can use a pneumatic drill to go out mining for us. But that might be asking for too much. We'll just have to see how this one performs first. In fact, I only need it to repair the living quarters at the moment. Benson, can you override it to make it begin work immediately? Yes, Captain. But be advised that it will be prone to errors, and its ability to navigate Moon Base 1 may be severely compromised. Understood, Benson. You may proceed. By your command. There it goes. It looks like it's heading outside. <laughs> or not. This thing's full of surprises today. Well, it is repairing something. I'm guessing the floor must have been damaged and was deformed slightly. I never even noticed. Ah, oh, it looks like it's gotten stuck. I'll try giving it a nudge and reissuing some of its commands to see if that moves it along. Uh, that seems to have worked, but I will follow it around for a while, just in case. Oh, for crying out loud. Come on, repair bot, move your ass. You've got blocks to fix. <laughs> Supreme leader. Oh, I guess we've got A1 to thank for that. I 
by your command. Okay, I think that's enough for now. I'll leave RepairBot1 to get on with it and let Benson update RepairBot1's code with any improvements as time goes on. I suppose in hindsight this kind of was my fault as, after all, Benson did warn me not to activate it so early and that there would be problems in doing so. That is correct, Captain. Ha! <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Rub it in, why don't you? Anyhow, now that we've got a working repair bot, it's time for the next phase. Hey guys! Repairs are progressing as planned, Supreme Leader Captain Robertson. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Repair Bot 2, but I think in future just Captain will suffice. Ah, I might need to raise the piston before it'll let me place the connector. Easily done. Perfect. All that's left now is to bring the Sagittarius over here. The reason why I want to do that is so that it makes it faster to get to, should I need to take off in a hurry. Plus it also means that, in an emergency, I can use the nuclear reactors on the Sagittarius to help power Moonbase 1 if the batteries start to run low. Which is a distinct possibility given that I've got the basic assembler and refinery going pretty much non-stop, making the components we need to repair this place. I also need to repaint the Sagittarius and upgrade its weapon slightly. This version is the one that's been nerfed to bring it in line with Martian Federation requirements. I want to bring it back to the original specification, which has two 25mm Gatling turrets as well as that three-shot artillery cannon used for demolition purposes. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still has the cannon, but those two anti-personnel turrets are just woefully inadequate against anything other than the smallest of drones or people attacking just wearing spacesuits. It's not that I plan on going up against the entire Martian Navy in this thing, it's just that I like to be able to defend myself should I come up against any opportunistic, unsavoury types out there whenever I leave the relative safety of Moonbase 1. Or at the very least, make them think twice before attacking me. Now, the question is, will the ion manoeuvring thrusters be enough to get me over there, as I'd like to keep my main thrusters off and save as much hydrogen as possible. Yes they are! Excellent! They're barely powerful enough, but they still work, and that's what counts. Right, let's bring this thing over there and set it down. Hopefully those two repair bots have done their job and fixed enough of the landing pad so that it's flat enough to land on. But I guess we'll find out once we get there. I just need to be careful not to go too fast, otherwise I risk overshooting it. I still haven't heard back from Marshal Gordon about what's going to happen to Aaron Arthur. My presence here is still supposed to be a secret, so for obvious reasons, the Marshal has decided that it would be too risky for anyone in the TCA Marshal Service to keep him detained. So he's forwarded on to members of the Terran Special Forces instead. Chances are that I'll either have to transport him to a nearby CDF vessel, that's if there's any left in the Soul System, or wait until someone comes to collect him. Either way, I'd rather he didn't stay here, as he is taking up space in that cryo chamber, which also requires power to run, I might add. And I certainly don't want to have to kill him, as he's not exactly what I'd consider a bad person. Even if he is here illegally, and, well, you know, did try to have me killed and all that. There we go, it's the middle one I want. I did a quick check earlier, and the underside camera in this thing is below the connector, not above it. Unlike some of the other vessels I've flown recently. Yeah, getting those camera and connector positions mixed up can range from being a mere inconvenience, not to mention mildly embarrassing, 
to being quite dangerous, especially if your landing gear, or an entire weight-bearing section of your vessel, isn't sitting securely, especially in one of those elevated landing pads. Thankfully it looks like the repair bots have finished their work and have vacated the landing pad, which is good, as accidentally squashing one of them whilst I'm coming into land really would be embarrassing. Not to mention expensive, as they do take a decent amount of components to build. Touchdown! Right, time to power down the thrusters and activate the magnetic locks on the landing gear. Oh, careful captain, don't slip. Right, let's take a look at it. Yeah, that's fine, there's plenty of space. The repair bots are definitely nowhere to be seen, so I reckon they must have moved on to repair somewhere else on the moon base. But that's okay, I'll just leave them to it. Right now it's time for me to work on the Sagittarius. First a repaint, and then an upgrade. Now, I can't remember whether it's 15 or 20 magazines these things can carry. Ah, uh, I'll check that out later. I'll finish building the other turret first before I mess around with the ammo. I will need to be careful though as there's not much left. Probably about 90 magazines in total, and I want to save the rest for the Moonbase's turrets. I'll just turn it off in the meantime, which is really just to stop it from moving around or trying to target anything until I've had a chance to configure it. I've divided the ammo magazines and moved them into this cargo container to make it easier to collect them now that the turrets are finished. All I need to do now is load the ammo. Yeah, I've changed my mind. They can't fit 20, but I'll only put 15 magazines in them and store the rest inside. That way we'll lose less ammo if a turret is actually destroyed. There we are. I'll put the rest inside the connector and move it later on. And there we have it, the Sagittarius has now been repainted and given a slight weapons upgrade. I've also taken the opportunity to remove the ore detector and install a seismic surveyor instead. I'd have loved to have had both, but sadly, we just don't have enough detector components for them yet. So in the meantime, I've chosen the one that's most useful to us first. Ah, I've just noticed I haven't finished painting that red W on the top. No worries, I'll do that later once I've recharged my suit. Caution, Captain. It has come to my attention that the carbon dioxide levels in the living quarters plant room and entrance corridor do not appear to be decreasing, despite both the CO2 scrubbers and the HVAC system being fully operational. Ah, shit. Acknowledged, Ben. I know exactly why this is happening, and I'm on my way back now. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'd better grab some more components. Well, this is what happens when you don't finish what you start. Although, in my defence, I was interrupted by Marshal Gordon whilst I was working on replacing some damaged pipes under the floor in the bar. I mean, it's not a huge priority, as I'm the only one here right now, but I'd better finish it now before I get distracted again, as one of those pipes does link up some of the downstairs air vents to the CO2 scrubbers. Anyway, I took what I needed from the plant room on the way, so this shouldn't take long. In fact, it looks like I've got more than enough. There we go, all done. 
Benson, that should be the issue of the CO2 levels resolved. I'd say give it about 30 minutes or so, and if you notice that the levels still aren't falling, or if you notice any other anomalies, then please let me know. Yes, Captain. I'm not going to bother wasting my time replacing that grate, though. I already lost most of my patience, and my sanity, trying to get the blasted thing to fit in earlier. What I'll probably do is just replace the entire floor later on. I mean, let's face it, there's nobody else here that's likely to fall in the damn thing anyway, at least in the meantime. Besides, right now we've got more pressing concerns. We're running low on iron to make steel, which means that it's now time we looked at doing some serious mining. Okay, I'm just going to quickly lift the Sagittarius off from the landing pad and set it down on the regolith just next to the refinery module. The reason why is because the seismic surveyor won't work through the moon base's structure. It needs to have direct contact with the actual ground in order to detect anything. The good thing is, the ground all around the moon base is relatively flat, so this shouldn't be too much of a problem. As always though, I just need to make sure that I maintain a fairly gentle descent rate, so as not to damage the landing gear or the seismic surveyor. Nice one. I'll just get into the other seat and use the monitors over there, as they should already be set up for use with the seismic surveyor. Oh good grief, I just realised that rhymed. Yep, that'll be the space madness setting in already. Oh that's brilliant! According to the seismic surveyor, we've got two large ore deposits next to the moon base. One in front, and a slightly smaller one just behind. And what I'll do now is use that readout on the left there to see what sort of ores it's detected. Interesting. According to where the spikes are in that graph there, we've got iron, silicon, and even cobalt in that first deposit. There doesn't appear to be anything else though, even after moving the scanner slightly. There might be ice in there too, but it's been filtered out in the settings, which was really just to try and prevent any anomalous readings more than anything else. I'll have a quick look at the one that's behind us now. Yeah, the only ore we're detecting in that one is just silicon. Again, there might be ice in there too, but we won't know until we get closer and use the detector on the pneumatic hand drill. Regardless, it looks as though the ore deposit in front of us is the more useful of the two. So what I'll do now is take the Sagittarius in closer and land next to it so I can check it out personally. The good thing is, at least with the seismic severe, we can now find the approximate location of any nearby ore deposits along with what we're likely to find in them. Which can make mining a lot less frustrating. Well, on planets and moons at least. In space, unfortunately, we still have to rely on the short-range ore detector. Right, this ground looked relatively flat, so I'll try and set the Sagittarius down around here. Yeah, this looks okay.
That'll do. Right, let's go outside and take a look and see what we can find. Yep, as expected from what the graph showed us, we've got iron. In fact, what I'll do is find where the distance is shortest and mark it as a waypoint, as that'll make it easier to mine later on. I'll probably use an automated mining drone rather than use one of the bots or do it myself, as it's not the most interesting of jobs and it'll be a lot faster too. As always, I'll just give it a very basic description. There we go, iron ore. You can't get any more basic than that. Okay, let's see what else we can find. Well, there's the silicon. I'm still not seeing any cobalt yet, but I've got a horrible feeling that might just be because it's deeper underground and my drill can't detect it. Yeah, if that's the case, that's going to be a challenge to extract later on, especially if I plan on using Caution. drones. Caution, Captain Robertson. I have just detected three vessels approaching us from orbit, 15 kilometers above Moon Base 1. Be advised that none of them appear to have active beacons or transponders. Shit. Acknowledged, Benson. I'm heading back to the moon base now. We're not expecting anyone, at least not yet, so there's a very good chance they could be hostile. Ben, just in case they're not sightseeing or passing by, can you activate the moon base's defences for me? Yes, Captain. All 25mm Gatling guns have been activated and sent to target hostiles. Thanks, Ben. Here's hoping we don't have to use them. Damn it, I'm hoping this is just a coincidence and are heading somewhere else, because if these guys really do mean us harm, then we could be in some serious trouble. Captain, one of the unknown vessels is trying to hail us using a secure CDF channel. Are they now? Acknowledged, Ben. Put it through. Moon Base 1, this is Task Force Sabre. We have three small capital vessels inbound to your location and are requesting permission to land. Do you receive? Over. Task Force Sabre, this is Captain Robertson at Moon Base 1. Permission granted. Please use the main and auxiliary landing pads and watch out for incoming traffic. Over. Copy that, Moon Base 1. We're already on our way and we'll be with you shortly. ETA 2 minutes, over and out. So they're our guys. Well, that's a relief. In hindsight, I should probably have asked them what they were doing here first, but I strongly suspect that these are the guys that are here to collect A1 and take them somewhere more secure. To be honest, I was expecting something like this to happen, but I thought they'd have asked me to rendezvous with them somewhere else instead. Or at the very least, bloody warn me they were coming first and not just suddenly show up like this. It's not too much of a problem though, because after hearing we had these vessels incoming, I was already getting ready to land the Sagittarius a short distance away from the moon base anyway. Mainly because if this place was ever going to come under attack, then I'd rather not leave our only spacecraft sitting in the middle of the landing pad, as it's right in the centre of Moon Base 1, and most likely to be hit by enemy fire, especially missiles. Well, the spacecraft from Task Force Sabre aren't due here for another minute or so, but there's still a very good chance I might be able to see them, so I'll just quickly go outside and watch them come into land. It is a little risky, I know, but I'm going to assume that they're all highly trained professionals, so hopefully none of them will crash into the moon base spectacularly and kill us all. <laughs> yeah, I joke about it, but that's actually one of the reasons why both the spaceport and the shuttle pads are so far away from the habitation module. In fact, for safety reasons, all of the modules are quite far from each other. Ah, there they are. That was quick. I can't make out what they are yet, and unfortunately I left my binoculars in the hab module. But seeing that, they are closing in pretty quickly, so I probably won't need them anyway. 
That larger X-shaped one with the lower wings and upper heat radiators is definitely an HAC-9 heavy attack craft. There's no mistaking that profile. I'm not sure what the other two are though. I'm seeing what looks like windows at the front, which suggests that these could be aerospace vessels with horizontal deck layouts designed to take off and land from a planet's surface, very similar to the Sagittarius. All of them appear to be in a low-vis grey. I'm not seeing any CDF colours on them though, just grey with dark grey almost black markings. Interesting. Anyway, they're getting close now so I better find a console to give them access to this place and go and greet them when they land. Alright, everything should be ready. I've allowed shared access to all the doors and I've made sure that both repair bots are back in the plant room and out of the way. You know, just in case they glitch out and try to repair something they shouldn't. Captain Robertson, I'm Major Dickinson, Bravo Squadron Special Aerospace Service Commanding Task Force Sabre. I understand that you've got a prisoner you'd like us to take off your hands. Yes, that's correct, Major. And welcome to Moonbase 1, by the way. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting three vessels, so I am a little concerned that your arrival may end up attracting some unwanted attention. Don't worry, Captain. We jumped in on the other side of the moon and gradually deorbited to try and reduce the chances that we were seen. Even if we were spotted as we arrived, they would still need to search here in order to find us. But we won't be staying long. We'll collect the prisoner, do some quick repairs, and be on our way. Copy that. The prisoner I've got here is a civilian named Aaron Arthur. He was staying here illegally and tried to fight me when I arrived. Whilst he's not particularly violent, he is, how should I put it, a little touched. I've currently got him in a cryo chamber in medical. I've unlocked all the doors and I can show you guys the way there. For obvious reasons, I can't keep him here as I've only got the one cryo chamber and it's unguarded. And I can't hand him over to the TCA Marshal Service as that would increase the likelihood that he'd talk to someone he shouldn't, or worse still, fall into enemy hands. Agreed. We'll make sure that Mr. Arthur is handed over to one of our intelligence officers. It'll be up to them to make sure he's kept safe and secure until it's safe to transfer him to the relevant authorities. We're familiar with the layout of Moonbase 1, so this shouldn't take long. Sergeant, if you could. On it, sir. That's great. Thanks for all your help, Major. Now, if you would be so kind as to please excuse me, I had better get back to work, as there's still a long way to go before this place is anywhere near what I'd consider to be fully operational. Very well, Captain. As you were. We'll talk later. That's A1 being escorted to Major Dickinson's vessel, named Einstein's Demon, right now. It's actually the safest place for him to be honest, as he risks being hurt and possibly even killed if he stays here, especially once the fighting starts. And I'm sure it will once I repair this place and declare it for the TCA. Oh, that reminds me. Task Force Sabre, this is Captain Robertson, Commander of Moonbase 1, to any quartermasters or logistics personnel. Whilst you're still here, you guys don't have any platinum or uranium to spare, do you? Hi, Captain. Lieutenant Jennings here. Negative. We're running low on those ourselves. Have you tried the First Class Minerals Trading Station near 129 Antigone? A friend of mine visited there two days ago and mentioned that they were selling platinum. Not sure about uranium, though. Ah, nice one. Thanks for that, Lieutenant. You're welcome, Captain. I'm also just admiring their spacecraft before they leave. I'm not familiar with that one that was using the auxiliary landing site, but the other one... Yep, this one over here is definitely an L-46, except they've modified it and added a whole bunch of weapons to it. Yeah, these are all ideal for what the Special Aerospace Service have been using them for, which is essentially hit-and-run attacks against Mars and their corporate allies. Major Dickinson, this is Captain Robertson. Please let me know when you guys are ready to leave, as I'll move the Sagittarius onto the main landing pad once it's clear again. Over. Acknowledged, Captain. Be advised that you won't have to wait long as we'll be lifting off within the next 20 to 30 seconds. Over. Copy that. Robertson out. Oh well, in that case I may as well just stay out here and watch them leave. As luck would have it, the sun is still up, so this should be quite impressive. Moonbase 1, this is Einstein's demon. Task Force Sabre requesting permission for takeoff. Over. This is Moonbase 1. Acknowledged Einstein's demon. Permission granted. Task Force Sabre, you are cleared for liftoff. Fly safe, Major. Thank you, Captain. Good luck and give those Martians hell. Dickinson, out.
You know what? I never get tired of watching this. Even in a vacuum where you can't hear the roar of the engines, it's still a sight to behold. I just hope all this activity hasn't given us away to Mars or ROS. Well, now that's over, I think it's time I made a start on our mining operations, but for that, I'm going to need both platinum and uranium. Sadly, there's too little of that here on the moon, and it would cost way too much power to extract it from the regolith, so my best options would be to either mine it from somewhere else or buy it from a trading station. And thanks to Lieutenant Jennings, we now have an excellent lead on where we can do the latter. Unfortunately, it does mean leaving Moonbase 1 and using the jump drive, but that's just a risk we'll have to take. Alright, let's take off and get into orbit as quickly as possible, preferably without burning through too much of our fuel, which shouldn't be a problem given the relatively low gravity here. Benson, do we have a waypoint for the First Class Minerals trading station at 129 Antigone? Yes, Captain. Would you like me to add the coordinates to the jump drive? Yes, if you could please, Ben, that would be great. Yeah, I knew we had the coordinates for the asteroid itself, but I wasn't sure if we had them for any of the nearby trading stations. That is good though, as it saves us the time we would have spent flying around the asteroid trying to find the damn thing. Sadly, I can't mine from the asteroid itself though, as there's a very good chance that the various corporations with stations nearby have already staked a claim on most of it. Which means that if I was ever caught digging away at it, I'd get into some serious trouble. And right now we can't afford to make any more enemies, as we need all the allies we can get. So, yeah, our best option right now is to check out that trading station. If they don't have what we need, then we can try mining some asteroids out in the belt. But that's a last resort, as I've swapped around the ore detector and would have to use the hand roll to scan the asteroids. And that would take sodding ages. But, as always, I guess we'll cross that bridge once we come to it. Benson, are we detecting any other vessels in the vicinity of lunar orbit right now? Negative, Captain. The only other spacecraft I am detecting are beyond lunar orbit, the closest of which is approximately 0.7 astronomical units away. Yep, same here, but I was just double-checking. Thanks, Ben. That also suggests that those SAS guys jumped out as soon as they got into orbit too. As I mentioned before, we need to try and keep that to a minimum to avoid detection. Ah, there we go. That's us in orbit now, so we can reduce our velocity and prepare to jump. Hopefully the trading station won't be too busy, as given our current situation, the quieter the better to be honest. Yep, the last thing I want to do right now is attract any unwanted attention. Okay, that should be fine. Initiating jump sequence. Okay, let's see what we've got. Oh, for crying out loud. I can see the station, but I can also see two Martian attack vessels as well. Damn it. According to my HUD, the larger one is an older Artemis Mark II, while the smaller is one of those new Type 4s, the Barbatio and Gundabad respectively. We could probably give the Type 4 a run for its money, as it's really just a glass cannon, but that Artemis would absolutely destroy the Sagittarius. And both together are more than a match for us, so if I can sneak in and get out without having to fight them, then that would be absolutely fantastic. The good thing is, they seem to be preoccupied with that cargo vessel, the Spirit of Yolnina, and since the Sagittarius is still registered to its previous owners, I should still appear neutral to them. <laughs> Famous last words again, Captain. Famous last words. Either way, I don't want to give them any excuses to get trigger happy, so all my weapons have been switched off, and both my beacon and transponder are on and displaying all the relevant information. Uh, the Barbatio's getting a bit too close. I'll move towards the station a little more to try and make things slightly more awkward for them, and just hope it doesn't provoke them.
Right, let's get this done as quickly as possible. Ah, hold on a second. I'd better check to see if I have any spare components I can take across with me, just in case I need to sell anything, as I vaguely remember both platinum and uranium being quite expensive. Okay, let's do this. Ah, it looks like the Barbatio is leaving. That's good, as it means that we'll only have the Gundabad to worry about. And if all goes well, they'll still be busy doing whatever the hell it is they're doing over there by the time I get back to the Sagittarius. Excellent. Hello? Hi. Don't mind me, I'm just looking around. There's the store, now let's see if they have what I'm looking for. Aha, there it is. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. It's almost 134,000 for a single piece of uranium and 229,000 for platinum. Ah, the problem is I've only got 10k in my account. I'll have to see if I can actually sell something. Nope, I don't have enough components to sell. Damn it. I knew they were going to be expensive, just not that expensive. But then again, with all the fighting that's been going on, it's not hard to see why. Well, shit. It looks like it's time for Plan B. Time to go out and mine some asteroids. Wonderful. Oh crap, they're on the move. They better not be coming this way. Attention Sagittarius, this is the MFV Gundobad. We have disabled your vessel and have orders to search it for contraband. Unlock your airlocks and prepare to be boarded. Warning Captain Robertson, our vessel has been disabled remotely and I am unable to regain control. Shit, I knew it. I bloody well knew it. Acknowledge Benson, I have no control and they keep powering down my thrusters. Gundabad, this is Sagittarius. Is this absolutely necessary? If you check your records, you'll see that it's only my wife and I. We're both in our 60s and just stopped here to get some supplies. Over. Sagittarius, this is not negotiable. We have detected that your Mars-registered vessel is equipped with unauthorized weaponry. I say again, prepare to be boarded. If you fail to comply or allow us access to your vessel within two minutes, we will open fire. Well, it was worth a try, but it looks like we're doing this the hard way. Gundabad, okay, okay, just give me a hot second. I need to wake up my wife and allow you access to the airlock. Please stand by, I, I'm going as fast as I can. Ha, <laughs> probably my least convincing impression of an old person ever. Those poor bastards. I know they're only following orders, but at the end of the day, they are the enemy, and I cannot let them come on board. Otherwise, it really will be game over, and I will have failed in my mission, and that I cannot allow. This bulletproof window is not exactly the best barricade, but it's not meant to be. I just need it to be hard to see, so for a split second, they don't realise it's there. Benson, can you change the settings on the port side outer airlock door so that anyone can use it, please? As you wish, Captain. Gondobad, this is Sagittarius. We've given you access to the airlock so that you may come on board. Over. Understood, Sagittarius. We are coming on board now. Ensure that both of you stand away from any controls and keep your hands where we can see them. That's right. Come on in, you bastards. Son of a bitch, I don't think they even managed to get off a single shot. Well, it ain't over yet. There's at least one, possibly two of them left on that ship over there, and I'll need to deal with them as well. Oh, crap. Better reload. Gotcha, you son of a bitch. Hmm. 
There, I should now have full control over the Sagittarius again. Yeah, it looks like this ship only had three crew, but I'd better head back now in case that last guy called for help. But before I do, I just want to check something first. I'll just put my spare components in here though, just to make sure I've got enough space before I attempt this. You know what? This might work. There's the asteroid, and I'm not seeing any other vessels nearby, so... Yeah, screw it. I've made my decision. I'm capturing the Gundabad, and I'm taking it back to Moonbase 1. The only problem is that its connector is in an awkward place, so I'm going to have to move it onto the top so that the Sagittarius can carry it and drop it off again safely. I will have to be quick and keep a sharp lookout though. Even if they haven't called for help, it's only a matter of time before the Martians wonder why their crew have failed to report in and send another vessel to investigate. There, now that should work. The only issue might be with that autocannon turret colliding with the front landing gear on the Sagittarius. It should have enough space, but I won't know for sure until I bring the two spacecraft closer together. Alright, that's enough messing about. I'd better dock these two together and get out of here as soon as we can. Ben, please add the coordinates of the lunar orbit above Moonbase 1 into the jump drive's computer for me, please. Acknowledged, Captain. Coordinates added. That's excellent. Thanks, Ben. Okay, time for the fun part where I attempt to line up the connectors of two vastly different vessels. The wisest course of action would be to get them as close as I can and then gently slide the Sagittarius into position. That way, if we notice that the landing gear is beginning to hit the turret, then we can stop before it gets too badly damaged. Or at least that's the plan. But suffice to say that as soon as any more enemy vessels appear, I'll be taking a much less delicate approach to all this. In fact, I may even leave the Gundobad behind if we are in enough danger and need to jump out immediately. Because at the end of the day, the overall mission of getting Moonbase 1 up and running is far more important than the capture of an enemy patrol vessel, especially a small one like the Gundobad. There we are. All that's left now is to gently slide it back until the connectors are aligned and ready to lock. Perfect. Thankfully, it doesn't look like the autocannon turret has been damaged. Good. Now it's time to get the hell out of here. I'd better disable the thrusters on the other vessel though, otherwise they'll constantly fight me all the way home to Moonbase. That's better. I'll switch them back on again as we're coming into land, as that's when we'll need them. Okay, that's far enough away now. I'll slow the Sagittarius down and prepare to jump. I don't want to jinx things, but it looks like we made it. Engaging jump drive. Okay, let's see where we are in relation to the moon base and begin our descent. <laughs> Brilliant. 
we return home in the Sagittarius with our prize attached. Unfortunately, the Gundobad's fate is that it'll most likely be grinded down into spare parts that'll help repair the rest of Moonbase 1. And those two ion thrusters at the back should have exactly what I need to construct a small mining drone. It's a shame it doesn't have a nuclear reactor or any uranium, but hey, you can't have everything. The funny thing is, I had forgotten that the sun was beginning to set before we left, so I am glad I left the spotlights and beacon lights on at the main landing pad. Otherwise, this part of our journey would be a lot more interesting. Or at the very least, it would involve a lot more swearing on my part. Thinking back, I am still shocked that I managed to take out all three of those Martian crewmen without a scratch. I fully expected to get peppered with rounds and possibly even end up badly wounded, captured or worse. Either those guys were very inexperienced or were just taken so completely by surprise that they didn't have time to react. I have to admit I did find it odd that they both hovered right in front of that airlock door rather than edged their way in whilst checking the corners, also known as slicing the pie. But that might have been because they were expecting there to be an inner airlock door behind the one they'd just opened, and not a heavily armed, armoured and pissed off Captain Robertson. The problem is that it won't take them long to realise that one of their ships is missing, and an investigation will soon reveal that the Sagittarius was the last vessel that the Gundobad was tasked to board and inspect, which means that I'm going to have to be a lot more careful when taking it out in future. That, and the fact that I upgraded the Sagittarius' weapons to what is considered illegal for Martian registered vessels, was a very careless oversight on my behalf. In retrospect, it would have been far safer for me to have gained some distance and jumped away again after I realised that there were Martian naval vessels on patrol there. But saying that, what's done is done, and it certainly could have gone a lot worse. There we go, I'll just cut the Gundabad's engines and disconnect the connector, and that should be it. Excellent. I'll just set the Sagittarius down on the auxiliary landing pad in the meantime, I'll move it back to the main one again later on. You know, after our prize has been broken down into its component parts, that is. Might as well refill my hydrogen whilst I'm here. Saves me having to travel all the way back to medical, I suppose. Yeah, I'll have to remember to replace that inner door and the light above it at some point. It is kind of important if you plan on leaving using that side of the vessel. I'm not used to seeing this place in total darkness. It's actually something of a novelty. And there it is, our prize, safe and secure. There are a lot of useful components that can be stripped from that, as well as the hydrogen that's sitting in that propellant tank it's got. Those artillery cannons and autocannon turrets are not of much use to me right now, but their ammo certainly is, as that can be disassembled and the magnesium extracted in order to make explosives for the warheads I'll need later on. I'll also take one of those Gatling turrets to replace the one that's missing on the moon base's perimeter, so that certainly won't go to waste. The jump drive might be useful later on, but I might just keep its components in storage as there's not much else that uses the gold and silver that you can get from it. At least, not that I'm aware of. I was tempted to keep the Gundabad intact and use it for myself, but the Sagittarius is by far a much more useful vessel to me. Anyway, enough of this, it's time for me to bring the robots back, because we've got work to do. I've repainted the Gundabad in a horrendous shade of bright pink, and also given Repairbots 1 and 2 a set of grinders. Why? Because I've programmed them to grind down anything that's in that exact shade of pink. Knowing full well that anybody who is still sane would never use that colour. 
I'll be staying out here with them of course, both helping them grind the vessel down and also make sure that they don't suffer from any temporary form of colour blindness, as I'd rather they only remove the blocks they're supposed to. But you know what? Overall I think we're making some really good progress so far, and as long as our luck holds, I think that Moonbase 1 will be fully operational in no time at all.